God had been working on me for a while, typically he does. He works on me so we can talk to you. And it's about extravagance. I put that in the title, extravagant. And when you use it with like talking about God, a lot of times people like, well, it's God, so let's just humble ourselves before the Lord and let's make ourselves mowing, going around with our hoods on. Ooh. You know, but that's not a Christian life. I mean, to me, and that's what he's telling me and through my journey is that this is that, you know, all excited, wow, the debt's been paid. I've been blessed. He opened, he gave us the keys to heaven, showed us how to use them and explains it. And he's in the side seat next to us the whole time going to heaven. You know, we're not left alone. And so he's like, well, you we'll, we know, things get us down and all that stuff. Understandable. But we got to have that checkpoint where we go, well, hey, I'm a child of the one true God. You know, come on. Dan sang, I love all the songs. I could have just said, there's your sermon. It's a wonderful, wonderful intro. And so as we go through these, just remember some of the songs we sang. And some of those words were just pushed right into our minds and stuff. Let's get going. When we have joy in our hearts, it will be obvious to everyone. A joyful heart makes a cheerful face. You can actually express it. You can actually walk with it. That's Proverbs 15, 13. So here's a little. A man walked by a table in a hotel lobby and noticed three men, that's three, three men and a dog were playing poker. And the dog appeared to be winning. The guy walked over and says, well, that must be one smart dog. And one of the other guys at the table says, he ain't that smart. Every time he gets a good hand, he starts wagging his tail. So, A.W. Tozer once said, no Christian, if he or she is right with God, should ever need to hide anything in their life. Because we don't have to live that life about, well, I've, I've been blessed by God, so I don't want to shove it in your face, but I've been blessed. No. Gratitude, thanking him, letting him notice that you are different, you know, than the rest of the world. Christian joy is more than happiness, which is an emotion. Joy is more accurately defined as an inner state of peace and a sense of well-being regardless of your outward circumstances. You know, you may be outwardly, you know, the world's just crumbling around you. But inside, we're bebopping right through, you know? Because Jerry says it all the time. We're just passing through. We get to go on. We got a destination that's, like he said last week, a new heaven. Everybody's worried about the, the heaven, but you know, it's going to be brand new for you. Another key ingredient to a joyful life is having a thankful heart. And a thankful heart is the direct result of remembering and reflecting on who God is and what he is doing in your life. So why did I title this message extravagant life? Everything in life changes. Relationships, jobs, family, fame, whatever that is. One minute you're the hero, the next minute you're the zero. There's only one thing, the entire universe, that won't change. And that's God's love. Knowing that God still loves you no matter what happens. Your failures, your brokenness, your sin, provides a rock-solid foundation in your life. With all that said, with all that is happening in this world around you, you need to live your life in the present that God and see what he's done for you in such an extravagant way. I've heard God love described as extravagant. We sing songs like one is called Your Love's Extravagant and Dan actually wrote one uh, called Extravagant Love. Uh, God loves you with, that is so extravagant, lavish love, okay? We're singing about it this morning, it was great. That you can never be, that'll never be taken away. It's beyond comprehension. He loves you on your good days. He loves you on your bad days. He loves you when it's raining outside, and he loves you when it's sunny outside. Because we got to remember, he's not worried about all this other exterior stuff. He's worried about you. God said he doesn't want you just to recognize the lavish love intellectually. Oh, that is very nice of what he's doing for those people. No, he wants you to recognize it emotionally. Take it in. Love is God's nature. God created the universe and everything in it for no other reason than so he could love it. Oh, and God created you 
So he wants to love you. Psalm 29, 1 through 2. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Cons okay, here, and I go to the, another one. Consider the same small word, so, S-O, that goes just before loved. In probably the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, the verse says, God so loved the world that he gave his only, you know, the rest of it. But we pause on so, because God just didn't, you know, someone says, I love you. That's sweet. Thank you. I so love you. I so love you. I mean, you can say it fast or slow, and you still get that, wow. It's not just love. He loves you. Yeah. In fact, Jesus shows us what real love is, his love, what it looks like. In 1 John 4, 9 through 10, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. He loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Many people say they love you. God showed how much he loves you. He loved you so much it hurt. He sacrificed his son. When Jesus died for you, he was saying he loved you so much that he would rather die so that you could live and he couldn't live without you. And the Bible says that what real love, the kind of love that you can build your life upon, looks like. Real love makes sacrifices. Real love endures to the end. Real love gives all. That's the kind of love only God has for you. He is waiting with open arms to show you. When we give all control over to God, we can focus on extravagant life he has for us. Last week, Pastor Jerry told us we're living in God's blessing and world. It's all his, for his glory. We're to be here for a reason. We're not just here, and especially if we're followers of Christ. Our fruitfulness, again from last week, our fruitfulness is what he fills us up with. We have all heard it a million times. Less of me, more of him. The very purpose of our existence is worship. And more expressively, worshiping him. Okay? And if we want to actually embrace that purpose, we need to use a precise definition. Worship is the act of ascribing worth directly to God. Worship, worshipful action may be done indirectly, but the Bible commands us to do it. It, com it commends us when we do it. So it tells us to do it, and it's happy when we give him the glory, the, the worship. Worship should be our highest expression of love to him. Um, it is not talking about anything other than direct, intern, intentional, vertical outpouring of adoration. While that does not have to be set to music, no, 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 no. We like it, or I do, because I'm that type of guy, I like music. But it doesn't take music. People sometimes say we go through the Psalms, you know. We all think those, you know, we all been told that a lot of those are songs and stuff like that. But they can just be read. We do it all the time. Your prayer can be your worship to him. You're giving the adoration back to God. Thank you. This has been a very horrible day, and I can't imagine, Lord, how it would have been if you weren't there, okay? And we've had those days, right? That's why I said it like that. You know, that's, that's the day you know. And so that should be even our glorious praise because he's there. If he wasn't, you think it was bad. Yeah, so... All right, I went off script, so the wife laughed. And that brings us back, bring me back, squirrel, that we verse we saw earlier, Psalm 29, 1 and 2. Now we're going to read it again. Ascribe to the Lord, you having heavenly being. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. 
for who he is. He can speak it and it is created. I'm good at just scrambling eggs, you know, and he can say the words. I have to do it. You got a God that's that good. Okay? These thoughts are echoed clearly also in 1 Chronicles 16 and Psalm 96. Worship involves the mind, emotion, and will. With all that we are attributing worth to the one who is worthy of all praise and glory. We are reminded almost every week here at Hope Light, God is in each and every one of us as a believer. We are his temple that is in this world. So on a Sunday morning or whenever two or more gathered or just you and God, you should give thanks to him for all that he has given you. Now we can write some of this stuff down and, and thank you for this, thank you for that. But then again, we just have to stop and realize I might have forgotten something. Lord, I missed on something today and I know it was you. And we got to be willing to say that to him got to be willing to be honest with him. Exodus 33, 16. Is it not in God's going with us so that we are distinct from every other people on the face of the earth? We have God with us. That's why when we look out and we see some people that are scaring you a little bit, the way their actions, they haven't chosen to live this life with him. Okay? So yeah, it does look scary. And you, that's where we pray for them. Oh, Lord, you need to just sneak up and bless them, you know? The word Christian means anointed ones, okay? A follower of Christ. That's what we are. And when I think of the, the living form of God, I think about two things. Extravagance, the name, and simplicity. Extravagance because God chose, as deity, to cloak himself in human form. What an over-the-top showing of his extravagant gift. All of who he is, he brought down here and placed in Jesus. And the simplicity of it is because Jesus was born to a simple family in a simple manger with basic human needs like us. He didn't live an extravagant lifestyle. You know, we all thought, all they were thinking back then he was going to be some big great leader. No, he took it to the simplest level and came as a baby first. I mean, what he's doing for us, God's extravagance. Yet his gift to us was the most extravagant in history. Maybe it boils down to simply gratefulness, to be like Paul when he says in Philippians 4, 12 and 13, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have, learned, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Again, the blessing is him. Gratefulness is being content, not only in the simplicity, but also in the extravagance. It's thanking God for the roof over your head the clothes on your body, the food in your stomach, the healing in your heart. With gratitude, I can receive gifts that seem extravagant. With gratitude, I can sacrifice to give greater gifts to others. Wait, to give gifts to others? Now, I liked it better when he was loving on me. I'm, I'm a human, you know, but now I've got to be I'm, I'm, I'm trying to focus on Christ and how he did this. Good example. we got to be willing, yes, to give to others. We must first be one with God. You better be working with him on a daily basis if you plan on carrying that act out. Living in his will. We all have to get this correct. If we are to live our life just like Jesus, we need to be ready to give. Our time, be able to give the word of God, our attention, stop and, help, and be there for someone. And the gifts that he's given us, pour them out around us. 
These are all, if you think about Jesus, I thought this was a pretty, pretty good definition of how he spent his time. You know, he didn't shush the children away. He, he, he corrected the disciples. No, no, no. Let them. You know, he, again, he showed time and he gave them his attention and he gave his gifts. And he could do the healings. That was a blessing. I mean, that was the way who he was. These are all things Christ shared with all of us. Is the life Christ lived large or extravagantly in your homes? This type of living large is summed up by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Be imitators of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as fragrant offerings and sacrifices to God. Paul describes a lifestyle you will find in Christ-centered homes. A family that is positively loves all Christ's. Excuse me, let's read that again. <laughs> a family that is positively loves as Christ loves. That all tall, that's a very tall order. I think the many times I have failed being a servant leader and I haven't been showing Christ, but I also thank him when I've had the courage to step out for him. Sometimes I'm not a very good imitator of God, you know? But sometimes... I am. I'm a work in progress. He's not done with me yet, and we can all tell that. I mean, we're all in the same boat. Paul is asking the impossible, is he? A closer look at Ephesians tells us a different story. It starts with a comforting fact that I am loved by God and that his son gave himself up as a sacrifice for me. My sin, the very evidence that I cannot imitate Christ, has been pardoned. My relationship with God has changed. No longer an internal condemnation, sinner. I'm a dearly loved child. The gospel tr transforms me. Not only should I be an imitator of God, empowered by the Spirit, I'm an intimid uh, excuse me, I, I am an imitator of God. It's a fact. Christians can answer in a very loud yes that the life of Christ is living large or extravagantly in our life. We don't have to hide away. We can stand up for what he wants for us. But what about our sinful, sin, sinful failures? There's a few of us I know that still bring that back up in our heads. Oh, you should go. You don't need to be saying anything, Brian. You know, you're not as good as anybody else. We all, try, we all have that voice. Sometimes we had to kick it out. But Paul explains it best in Romans seven eighteen. I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. Again, I must look to my Savior. Again, on my own, I am what I am. That little over there in the corner screaming and shouting. But if I'm a child of Christ and living like that, it's the life centered on the cross, what Jesus did. Romans 6, 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. The Christian life is also a life of continual growth through faithful use and the means of grace. Grace. He's given us that gift that's so aligned to walk on. Do I just keep working and working and working and working and working to keep his grace? No, it's just given to me. Slow down on your working. Know why you're doing it. If you're worshiping the Lord, if you're praising him and doing it, work, walking in his will, there you go. But if you're thinking you have to build something, create something, do something, you forgot what the card said. It was free, free gift of grace because he loves you. The gospel which comes to us in word and in sacrament is the means that the Holy Spirit uses to install genuine zeal and commitment inside of us. The fruit of the Spirit marks home where the life of Christ is lived extravagant. Galatians 5, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. 
It's a good order. And again, you better be leaning on him to work your way through those. The family that is living an extravagant life follows that example of Christ. The family, this family speaks God's truth in love, okay? There's a big put there. In love and avoids the deadly legalisms that appeal to so much of our sinful nature. Well, they all shouldn't be doing that, you know. I should be doing a few things myself, you know. So we can let God. In the gospel, we're going to see why. Of John, we see how the Pharisees dealt with a woman caught in adultery. They showed no love for the sinner, only a misguided zeal for the law and the desire to carry the law out to the letter of its intent. The transparency of their action was made evident by their desire to trap Jesus in a seemingly no-win scenario. John 8, 4 and 5. Teacher, this woman was caught, the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commended, commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? And Jesus got right to the heart of it. He knows what they're doing. And here's his response in John 8, 7. If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw the stone at her. Mm. The Pharisees, unable to respond now, went away one by one and left Jesus alone with the adulterous woman. In John 8, 10 and 11, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus de declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. Wow. Okay. Good instruction right there at the very end. Possibly for me. I might have heard that myself. Go now and leave your life of sin. But at the same time, what an extravagant just what happened there. You know, everybody in the crowd was, had their rocks already. Christ's love, his love covered the sin. But he cared so much about that sinner. He died for that sinner. Okay? Again, there's a few things we have to let God control. Okay? We are probably, or I was probably, one of the people with a rock in my hand. I had to go away and just leave it there. But the love so lavishly given out to this woman is also ready to be poured out on you, on us. What an incredible promise we find in John 15, 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. If we dwell continually in his presence, put him first, cleave to him as the source of our life and absorb, embrace, and speak his word, we can ask whatever we want and it will be given to us. What an extravagant promise for an extravagant God. But wait a minute. Somebody may not have come in, in the middle of that conversation. They may have just read portions of that scripture and that part of the Bible. They may not have read the whole entire intent. So, so what it looks like you're saying is I can ask anything through Christ and he will, he will hey, I get my wish, my genie in a bottle. No. You got to go back to what I started at. But if we dwell, be, in, live, in with him continually, in his presence, put him first, not me. Cleave to him as our source of life. And absorb, it means like listen, receive, embrace, take it as, hmm, this is good stuff. I might want to keep this. And speak his words. So when we ask, for it to be done, our heart's in the right position to ask for requests. You'll probably find 
that your request is his will anyway at that point. Okay? The wishful of the genie in the bottle, the lottery, whatever you want to call those things on the other, outside of the world. Okay. But if we start all with that again, with him, and we ask, our simple ask will be a lot, a lot easier. Okay? You just want to pray to Jesus. Dear Jesus, you are truly a, re a reward of those who diligently seek you. You are a promise keeper. And when we meet your conditions, we will reap the extravagant benefits of the particular promise. Maybe you've lost your grip on the powerful way you once believed that God was using you. Or you can't get over the sore spot in your memory that won't quit hurting. Or you're giving up on ever finding financial peace. Your thoughts of coming through this and getting things better and living paycheck to paycheck. Could it be that, that it's just not in the cards for you? Should you finally resign yourself to the fact that the best days are behind you? You could believe that. I could believe that. If we didn't believe in the goodness of God. We could believe that the scriptures didn't say anything like this. But in Psalm 27, 13, and 14, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your hearts take courage. Wait for the Lord. So what keeps us from waiting and believing in his goodness? Our problem could be twofold. First, we spent so much time striving to fix our problems We've tried to give it a better effort. We've tried piercing together and piecing things to work out. We've tried approaching it from different angles. We've, and every time, the solution still works out not so good. What else could I do? There must be something else I'm not doing enough of. I'm not doing it right. And of course, you heard all the I's in that students. There's something else you could do. You could be getting still and knowing that God is, like in Psalm 46.10, cease, strive, and know that I am God. You could realize that some of these things he allows to persist in your life, things you can't seem to change and resurrect, and perhaps they're there because he wants to show you how he moves. And when you wait for his faith, keep believing in that goodness. As you wait, does anybody like sitting in that steaming hot pot of water? No. But he is God. You are to wait. He will take you from this. He will keep you going. Second thing, we all sometimes we, we keep monitoring it. Do you all keep like a little spreadsheet around the house? Well, how are things going today? How are things going this hour? How are things going in the last 10 seconds? You know, we keep monitoring the instant. And God's trying to tell us, put it all down. My time plan works a lot better. He doesn't live on time. Oh, so that's freaking us out because we know 24 hours in a day. And we know, you know all these numbers. But he doesn't live like that. He's got time. He's got, what is it called? Eternity, you know, on his side. <laughs> so he's willing to wait. This is such a small little speck on the curtain rod of your life, okay? But he's got it all. He hasn't even stopped for time. He's there tomorrow, yesterday, and today, right now in our world. So we have that problem. But the goodness of God is not accurately calculated by taking daily readings. Okay, that's good. We should just, again, wait, pray, let him handle it. We don't need to keep grasping for evidence. Oh, is this something good? Do we hear good nose coming? Is the weather changing? I mean, we keep waiting for everything. All the testimony we need to find is in the enduring declaration of his goodness that fills scripture. If we'll believe those, our hope will no longer be dependent upon temporary dips and spikes and trends in our little perceived world. We can, in Psalm 37, 7, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Whew. That'll take prayer on its own, okay? 
Because again, we're moving people. We got, I got a schedule, you know, and it's an itinerary I think I have to keep. But do all that, but also be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Because he is good no matter what. And if we can trust that we'll see the goodness in the land of the living, we're waiting. So what is God trying to tell us this morning? I've said a lot, yes, yes. But his word that he's been trying to tell me through this last month and a half, live the life with him leading the way. We've heard it a thousand times. You've read all the self-help books. People have told you this. You just got to let God take this, you know. I don't know why I did that accent, but I did it. So anyway, but, you know, he's got to be the one in control. Someday I'm going to release the keys forever, but I don't even realize I'm not even holding the keys, and I think I am. We have done enough already on our own, right? We've dug enough. We've put a big enough hole. We've, we've done whatever we're going to do. Give the wheel to him. First, give yourself a break. You don't have to have all the answers. Some people look to you because you've got all the answers, and that's cool, but sometimes you don't have all the answers. Start with love. Where did Jesus start? Work on that. Jerry says it all the time. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Let's work on that. Can't get too much trouble. <laughs> I hope not. Stop loving me. I don't know about that, but we'll let somebody stop and listen for the sweet, soft voice. So as you're waiting, just wait for that voice. It's there. I've written it out. God's a gentleman. He's going to let you just fret, 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 fret away and just go a little crazy stirring and making your mind go upside down. And are you done? It's the little toddler. We all love them that are just <laughs> frantic, throwing their temper tantrum. Are you done? Okay. Rest on all his promises. Remember his words. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He loves us so much that he made a way for us when there was no way. Jesus, he sent Jesus for us. There's the key to heaven. Now, let the Holy Spirit lead the way. Speak with him like your best friend, and share your dreams. You might think that sounds funny, you know, talking to God and sharing with him how your day went. He was there, right? But mm, as soon as you're old enough and you got kids, sometimes in your life you just like it when they come and tell you what they're thinking. You might have a good idea what's going on in their mind, but it's nice to hear said out loud. Don't write it in a text. I don't know where to send it to, to God, but speak to him. Tell him your dreams. Every parent loves. Again, you know by your own kids' hearts and what their dreams are. And it's just what a father wants to hear. He is waiting for you to share with him everything about your day. And he is waiting for that time with you. Dan, you want to come back? God has done so much with us all and has so much for us more to give. Let us finally choose to follow what he has planned. You just might find out that it was one of those dreams you were thinking about already, and now it seems like it's going to happen. So come on, come all who are burdened and carrying a heavy load. Exchange it for more extravagant, loving relationship with your Heavenly Father. He is there waiting, like a true gentleman, for you to let him walk with you. So get out of the rat race and slow down and live that extravagant life. Amen. Thank you, Lord.